Welcome back to the Own Your Awkward podcast. I'm your host, Andy Vargo, and every episode we get into what has made our guests vulnerable and how they've learned how to own their awkward in order to live their best life. Stay tuned so you can hear every awkward moment in today's show. Everybody. Welcome back to the Own Your Awkward podcast. I'm your host, Andy Vargo, and today we have Dr. Melissa Hughes, who is the author of Happier Hour with Einstein and also the host of Neuro, her Neuro Nuggets videos on YouTube and LinkedIn. Melissa, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's such a pleasure to have you on. You are one of the most inspiring people that I have met in the last year, and I just, I tell people all the time so many things that I've learned from you about how to cope and and get our brains working for us, and so it's just an honor for me to have you here to to talk to you today, so thank you. Well, thank you. I, I echo those sentiments right back to you. I think you're one of the coolest cats I've met in a very long time, so thank you for that. <laughs> Well, well, thank you. Uh, so for, for the audience that doesn't know, uh, Melissa and I met actually at the No Longer Virtual Conference in Atlanta this year, so just this last February, and that's the conference that Sarah Elkins put on, puts on every year to take connections that you know online and make them real-life connections. So very much an asset to go to that conference, and this is a perfect example of uh, you know, I did. We weren't even connected on LinkedIn. We were connected with a lot of other people in our networks, and we met there. And now we're connected in both ways. Absolutely, I've I've attended that conference um, since the very beginning, since year one. And every year, I walk away with yet more valuable connections, uh, like what I found in you. So I highly recommend the No Longer Virtual Conference as well. It's a network. It's not even, you can't even call it a networking conference. I don't even know how to describe it. You just have to trust me and go, and you'll be, you'll be <laughs> glad you did. No, I know. I walked away feeling more like I went to a retreat than anything else. So, um, oh, that's a good way definitely. to put it. That's a very good description. Yes, yes. And um, so, Melissa, what is uh, some exciting stuff you have going on or you want to make sure that everybody knows about? Well, I have been really digging in. So uh, my first book was Happy Hour with Einstein, and the whole, the whole point of that book was I'm a complete neuroscience geek, and I get that not everybody loves research studies the way I do. And, you know, when I talk about research studies, and the neuroscience jargon, I get the dazed and confused look, like the eyes glaze over and, you know, people are, are <laughs> just kind of check out. And, but what I, what I found along the way is that people actually really are interested in learning how the brain works and how to make it work better. And so the whole purpose of Happy Hour with Einstein was to kind of offer it up like as if we were just sitting at the bar, sharing a glass of wine at happy hour, and I could just kind of share this new cool thing that I learned. And it was, I got such great feedback from happy hour that I wrote happier hour. And along the way, a big piece of that was um, the gratitude piece and what gratitude actually does to your brain. And I know that um, I don't have to talk to you, Andy, about journaling because you have some amazing journals. And I actually just picked mine up and I'm so excited to start my 60 days of life-changing journaling um, with yours. But um, what I have found in the last couple of years or so, and I do keynotes and I go into organizations and kind of help them understand what's going on in that brain of theirs individually and collectively that impacts team dynamics and creativity and innovation and all of that stuff is that um, people feel the company organizations are largely focused on how do I improve engagement and company culture and everybody's looking for the secret sauce to that and what i have found is that gratitude and appreciation creating a culture of gratitude is one of the single most significant things that an organization can put in place and so i'm working uh, right now i'm working on a white paper which will be available for free download 
on my website, um, hopefully within the next week or so. Um, but I'm also taking that whole concept of expressing gratitude in the workplace and, and, and understanding what the ROI is on that very simple behavior that is rarely done in, in, our, in our workplaces today. Is statistics show that very few people express gratitude at work. And it's one of the wow. best things you can do. Yeah, so I'm I'm pretty jazzed about getting that underway. Yeah, and and you know it really is so simple, and it and it costs nothing to do, which is just when you talk about the secret sauce, it's it just is amazing that that's something that's so simple and easy and free to to just say thank you or you do a great job. I love what you are bringing to the the organization. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, there are so many studies out there. Some of the, like to your point, the simplest things, they require no training, no money, you know, uh, like a smile. I and mean, we now can look inside the brain and understand what happens when someone smiles. And when we smile, the brain releases automatically, without even knowing that this is happening in our brain, the brain releases those good chemicals like dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin. And what's really significant about that is not just that they make us feel better, but they actually make the brain work better because those good chemicals facilitate activity in the prefrontal cortex. And then on top of that, if you add this concept called emotional contagion, when someone smiles at you, it's almost impossible not to smile back. And we have these neurons in our brains called mirror neurons, and they enable, like, when I look at you and you smile, my, because I can feel empathy, because I understand what, uh, what smiling and happiness feels like, then my brain, the neuron mirror, mirror neurons in my brain release those same good chemicals. So it's like you're passing that good, positive, emotional state onto me. And the flip side of Mm -hmm. that is we can also pass those negative emotional states on. So, you know, think about the last time you were stressed at work and, you know, maybe you had a difficult conversation with a colleague or you're really struggling with a project and you walk into a team meeting about something completely unrelated and you have this frowny face on or you're frustrated or angry or whatever that emotion is, just that expression on your face spreads those same negative chemicals to the people sitting in that room. So you start that meeting with a completely negative mind space that those people, that had nothing to do with where you were. And you might not be angry. Maybe you're frustrated or stressed or whatever it is. I mean, it's, it's really important that we understand that we have a choice in how we show up and how we show up really impacts everybody else that's there. Wow, that is that's such an intriguing concept to think that you can basically alter someone's mind by what you're putting out into the world. <laughs> you know, it's like you actually have that much power, whether we like it or not, and other people have that much power over us because we're we're receiving and we're giving constantly with each other, and, and we forget that I think too way too often. Yeah, I don't think we we I do not think we um, recognize it for what it is. You know, there's a guy who wrote brain fluent um brain fluence uh, is kind of in in the in the sense of neuromarketing and how to use what's going on in your brain to um influence consumer behavior and um mm. one of the things that he says is you know that whole idea of fake it till you make it is so true mm-hmm. like even you know just even Smiling, just if, if you're in a really bad mood and you intentionally force yourself to smile, you can actually change your mindset by your expression. We think that our expression is a reflection of our mindset, but our expression can actually influence our mindset as well. So, you know, there's all of this new research that just talks about what's going on between our ears, and we're not even aware of it most of the time. Well, well what I love about what you bring to the world is you explain it in such a way that you take this really technical brainy scientific data 
and all these facts about how our, our mind works, and you basically help us understand it in a way that we can take into our life, where you just say, if you smile, other people are going to smile. And then you, you give us the information behind it to understand the 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 words that I already forget, the, the neuro neurons, is that the right The, the term? M- mirror, mirror neurons, right, mirror neurons. Mirror neurons, okay, so it's, gotcha. But it's, yeah. but Andy, it's, it's so true. So, so today, I, I, and you know, to anyone who's listening, uh, here's my challenge to you. I want you to smile at as many random people as possible, and you count the number of smiles you get back. It's almost impossible not to smile when someone smiles at you. And just know in that, you know, less than 10-second exchange, you've actually changed the chemistry in their brain. I mean, I think that's one of the coolest wow. things ever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, it's, it is because it's – it's just such an amazing concept that to me, that's such a gift you can give someone where it's, it's like you've helped make their day better. You've helped maybe help them function better that day. Maybe you've helped lift their confidence, whatever it is. You don't know where that's going to take them. Maybe they're on their way to an interview and they're going to have the confidence to maybe get the job or they had a really bad day and they're feeling depressed and you just pick them up a little bit. It's such a gift. That is so true. And you mentioned um, adding confidence. So there are lots of studies that show people who smile. First of all, smilers look younger than non-smilers. So we actually take shave years off of our age, which I personally in to- in, am in total favor of. Um, <laughs> yeah. But also we look more confident. We appear more confident. We appear more approachable. We appear friendlier. So uh, for any of those folks out there that are getting ready to walk into an interview, smiling is your total friend. Like, you, you need to, like, mm. smile, smile, smile. It's, I mean, n- not yeah. only that, but knowing that you, when you smile at the person who's interviewing you, sitting across that desk, you're actually influencing that person's brain. Now, that's delicious to know mm-hmm. that. Yeah, that's some power right there. Wow, that that is so much good stuff. I, I could listen – for hours to this stuff and and it is so helpful as we walk into the day to know that it's not just you know nice to know kind of stuff it really is important and it really is powerful so so Melissa uh, you have had an awesome journey and you're doing such awesome things bringing such good stuff to the world what is that awkward thing you've had to learn how to own in order to get to where you are today ah so, okay, this is confession time, right? Um, mm-hmm. Well, so uh, my journey started in, in a fourth grade classroom. I was in education. I was a teacher, and I left the classroom, and I went into educational publishing, so I got to do some things in, in the corporate side. And then it's been – I've been doing my own thing for eight years, now. I cannot even believe it was eight years ago that I started doing this um, this thing that I'm doing where I'm helping everybody, you know, other people learn about the brain and how to make it work better and, and, and applying that neuroscience in organizations so that they can improve company culture and employee engagement and um, reduce, you know, reduce turnover and, and all of those kinds of things that organizational leaders care about. But I think what my awkward thing that I've had to overcome is I have always been that overachiever. I have been thirsty for knowledge. I was as a child, I was as a teacher, and, and I am today. And <clears throat> there was a point at my in my life that I started to really doubt what I was doing and, and wondering if, um, if people out there were going to expose me for a fraud um, because, you know, I wasn't in a lab working, looking at, you know, brain scans every single day. I was this person who could, who could understand those brain scans and translate them for other people. And somewhere in there, there was this little piece of me that said, mm, I, I, I'm an imposter and people are going to find me out for the imposter than I am. And not too long ago, Kevin Monroe and Kimberly Davis and I, Kimberly Davis is the author of Brave Leadership, and Kevin Monroe is the, uh, he, is a, he has his own podcast and gratitude challenge as well. Great people, great folks to follow. But we had a conversation about the imposter syndrome. And I think for me, it's 
it, uh, what I didn't realize is just how pervasive it is. And the more it seems like the more successful you are and the more driven you are, the more you're the more likely you are to experience this. And the statistics say like 80 some percent of us experience imposter syndrome at some point in their lives. And I think that was probably the, one of the biggest aha moments for me, because not only did it teach me about how my brain was working, but it also kind of shows just how connected we are, how vulnerable we are. I'm just on a human level, we all have that inner critic who sometimes speaks really loud. And if you think about, you know, the times that you've been super critical of yourself, you'd never talk mm-hmm. to your friend the way you talk to yourself sometimes. I mean, you just never would. Oh, and, oh and yeah, it's, it's we, the person you would avoid more than anything. Yes, for sure. And um, and yet that voice, that's the person who we live with uh, 24-7. We even have conversations with that inner critic in our dreams because, you know, your dreams, when you dream at night, it's the residual of your thoughts from the daytime. It's the stuff that you really didn't put away. And your brain is still kind of processing that. So, you know, I think the more that I've learned about imposter syndrome and the more that I understand, like, some wicked, successful people who struggle with it. And, and, it, and it, only is, it, it only subsides when you're able to, like, kind of accept that it happens. It happens to all of us, and we all have that critic. And we understanding how to deal with that critic is really one of the most important steps to, you know, self-awareness awareness and and self-actualization which is kind of on the very top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and so I think that's been my awkward uh that's one of my awkward things that I've had to overcome and it's a Mm -hmm. I'm a work in progress we all are right we're all a work in progress well yeah no matter how far along our journey we get this it's like well now we need to work on this and now we need to work on that and I do have to say that when you you shared part of that journey with me earlier in the year when we had caught up, first time we really talked on the phone after NLV, and I have told people that part of your story so many times when I'm talking to them because that, for me, your aha moment became such a huge aha moment for me this year. And I'll tell you the thing that I've started to do when, when you look at reframing something, which, you know, that was our friend Heather Younger, her whole TED Talk was about reframing and getting yes, through adversity, and and I've yeah, and and I've 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 realized how much I've had to do that this year because now when I start to feel that imposter syndrome, because one thing that you mentioned and you, you mentioned it kind of quickly, so I want to make sure people hear it again is that the more successful you are, the higher likelihood or the more often you could have imposter syndrome, and it's, so it's my healthy. reframing, yeah, it it and. So my reframing now is when I start to feel that way and doubt myself, I say, oh, good, I must be getting more successful because I'm having oh, this happen again. I love that. <laughs> and, I love that. I'm and I've had to do that, that a lot. <laughs> so, I'm feeling that. It's, it's, it's been yeah, so helpful, you know, it, though. Yeah, and it's so true. I had a conversation not too long ago with um, a, a gentleman who is, very successful. He's an attorney, and he. Uh, we, we. The conversation was not about imposter syndrome by any stretch, but he he shared his perception of me, and I think by now you can tell that I'm not very bashful. Like <laughs> I'm pretty outgoing. Uh, right. Um, I'm a. You know, I, I appear to be very much of an extrovert and very comfortable in my own skin, and and all of those things. And so he's sharing his perception of me when we first met. And it was funny because when we first met, I was not in a very good place. My inner critic was squawking to beat the band. I mean, that critic was loud. And, um, and, And so it's funny because it was kind of a time for me to step back and say, we all have to fake it till we make it sometimes. But you know, how how much better would it have been at that point if I would have perhaps had this conversation about imposter syndrome with you or with Heather or with Kimberly and Kevin, you know, 
because when mm-hmm. you have the conversation and you go, oh, Kimberly and Kevin and Andy, they've all had this too? Well, I respect all of them, and they're all very smart people, and so I feel like I'm in good company, you know? So to your point, <laughs> right. I, I, you know, it is, it is a, there is a reframing exercise in there and Heather would be proud of us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And the, the thing is, um, it, I, it was that exact same feeling that you just said from the conversation was I'm thinking, why would Melissa have imposter syndrome? She's a doctor. She's written these books. She's, you know, she's, she's the one that we all look up to. How could she feel anything negative about herself yet? No matter how, how far you've come, there's still that, you know, that little devil on your shoulder that's that's giving you bad thoughts about yourself. So. Yeah, and you know, part of it, so, part of it is this unconscious bias that's happening in on our brains, and it's called the Dunning Kruger effect. And Dunning Kruger is a double-edged sword. So what Dunning Kruger says is that the less you know about a topic, the more you think you know. So. Uh-oh. People who you know, and, and I and it, there's there's all kinds of applications. So you know there are arguments that people who know absolutely nothing about climate change or the science of climate change are some of the loudest proponents that it's a hoax or it's you know whatever, and and mm-hmm. they claim to know more than scientists who have spent their entire lives gaining this knowledge base of the science. On the other end of that spectrum is people who know a lot about something, they actually doubt how much they know for two reasons. They either believe that everybody knows as much as they do or more, or they mm-hmm. come to this place where they know what they don't know. So, oh, right. you know, Self-actualization is really understanding that knowing what you don't know, not knowing what you do know. Mm -hmm. Like the real experts are people who know what they don't know and then are able to go find it from someone else. So the people who claim to know everything, the people that are experts in everything, those are the people who have no idea what they don't know. And so part of that whole imposter syndrome, is it's all embedded in the Dunning-Kruger effect in there. Well, that makes sense because the more you learn, the more aware you become of how much more you need to learn to really fully understand something. And so then that would kind of perpetuate the feelings inside of you. That's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm curious when you had this aha moment for people who, who need to discover these things about themselves, did you did, were you reading a textbook and you said, "Oh, this is what I have," or, or how did you come to terms with realizing that this was okay to feel like an imposter? Because that's not something that comes easily. Right. So, I had started to write. I was writing a lot in my journal, and the word that kept coming up over and over again was fraud. Like I felt like a fraud, and um, you know, I, I know that I'm not telling people things that aren't true, Uh, but there was kind of this nagging voice inside me that said, why should anybody listen to you? I mean, aside from the fact that I've got the credentials and the, uh, the education and the experience and just a complete thirst for learning, I still was questioning why, why would anybody listen to you about this particular topic? And this word fraud kept coming up, and I stumbled across an article. Uh, it was actually a blog post about imposter syndrome, but the, the title was I'm a Fraud. And it, I immediately, I knew nothing about this blogger, or I had no idea what this particular blog was about, but I, that word just kind of sucked me in. And it was, in fact, about imposter syndrome. So then I had a word. Then I had a name for it. And then I could go find out what that's all about. And strangely, just being able to put a name on something really gives us comfort. It, it's, it's mm. you know, the old, the old, the known is, or the unknown is always scarier than the known. Like once you know what it is, well, then you can talk about right. it. You can read about it. You can learn about it. Um, so, so that's, I kind of stumbled upon it by happenstance. And then I was, you know, 
just thrilled to learn that I was totally not alone. In fact, I am in the majority, not in the minority. Um, so that yeah. was really good news too. <laughs> You know? <laughs> right. And to look at it and know that you're in of that majority, you're in very good company of the people who who uh have that in the back of their head. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how do you step through that now? Because it doesn't just go away. Do you have a trick that you can convince yourself in those dark moments that hey, this is this is what it is? Yeah, I, I think, you know, when that does, and it creeps up, I mean, it creeps up on all of us, and, and sometimes it's not about work, so maybe it's about, you know, you, you doubt yourself in what you give to a relationship, or, you know, some social cause, or I don't know what it is, but it, when it does creep up, I think what I have learned to do is talk to myself the way and reason with myself the way I would reason with a friend. So if you called me, Andy, and said, I just need to talk. I'm like, I'm really struggling with this because I just I don't think, you know, I, I have what it takes to do X or whatever it is. You know, well, how would I, how would I talk to you about that particular thing? I would reassure mm-hmm. you. I would tell you, Andy, come on, you're kidding me. You do this fantastic podcast, you have these amazing journals, you have this great book, you make people laugh, you go into these organizations and you do, you make things make sense for people. And and that's how I would talk to you if you were struggling with this. And what I've learned is that is how I have to talk to myself. Because I am accomplished and I have done, you know, great things and I have, and I'm proud of my work. Um, so mm-hmm. I have to learn how to talk to myself accordingly. Um, the same way I would talk to anyone else whose work I was really proud of. Yeah, and I, I love that you mentioned it isn't just at work because we can have these feelings in any aspect of our life, and, and that's really important to acknowledge because that can eat away at having good relationships or having, you know, exp- bring our talents to, to the best use in our hobbies or volunteer organizations or whatever we're doing around town. Um, so I think it's that's super important. Yeah, and you know, I think the other thing too, I work with foster kids and um, some of these kids have had, just have been dealt a very difficult hand and they have very few, if any, good role models in their lives. And so one one of the things that I try, that I prioritize in my work with them is, is giving them, kind of filling their backpack with things that they can take throughout their lives that will help make the challenges um, a, a, a stepping stone for growth rather than an obstacle for them. And I tell them the four phrases that you need to take with you throughout your lives that will make it easier and better and more rewarding and more fulfilling are please, thank you, I'm sorry, and I need help. And wow. I think we we are we are – we are wired to connect with other people. And, you know, when you think about when you're really depressed, what do we tend to do? We isolate. And when we're really depressed, the last thing we need to do is isolate ourselves. We need to be with Mm -hmm. people who are going to smile at us and release all those good chemicals in our brains, right? Yeah. So we tend to do the exact opposite thing that we need to do when we're in a bad place. That we need the most. Yep. So those are the four, those are my four, but I try, but again, I'm a work in progress mm-hmm. like everyone else, but please thank you. I'm sorry. And I need help are the four things that will get you the farthest in life. I think. I, I love those four. I wrote them down and circled them and I hate to say it, but we are so close to running out of time here. Is there one last thought you want to leave everybody with? I think that is beautiful right there, but. Yeah, so, Noelle, um, I do, like you mentioned earlier, I do a weekly neuro nugget. It's just a very quick three- to five-minute video nugget of something about how the brain works, and you can subscribe at melissahughes.rock. Awesome. Well, we will have all of your contact information and social media in the description here, and definitely subscribe and connect with Melissa and follow her stuff because it's really good stuff. So many things that we've talked about today I've seen in her Neuro Nuggets videos and in your blogs and 
it it makes me do better every day. And so I really appreciate you, Melissa. Uh, thank you for joining us today. It, it's been very enlightening and very, very special to have you on. Thank you, Andy. The pleasure has been mine. Thanks. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much for listening in for today's show. Be sure to visit awkwardcareer.com to continue your journey. And of course, please like, subscribe, and share with your friends so they can find their awkward side and learn how to own it.